Um, I am Jim Nettles. I am an author. I do a lot of business and technology consulting work. I work with a lot of different organizations. Um, and I'm not an attorney, but I occasionally will play one on TV. <laughs> so go to him for your legal advice and tell all, everyone that it was his legal advice that got you where you are. So uh, I am Andrew Greenberg. I am the executive director of the Georgia Game Developers Association. I've written codes of conduct for that organization, for events that we put on, for our volunteers, for our board of directors. I'm not giving legal advice. Uh, and uh, I've written them for social organizations, for my own companies, and so forth. And uh, yeah, a lot of dramatically different ones over the years. Um, maybe we want to start with, uh, well, I guess we should ask you if any of you have written codes of conduct. Nope, if any of you are in the midst of writing codes of conduct. Nope, if any of you conduct yourself very badly. Yes, that's definitely. Are, are you the reason for, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> Are you the reason that code of conduct is being written? If so, so uh, maybe we start with um, the variety of them that is out there, and then start getting into specifics. I find the different needs for different types. Well, and, and I think it's worthwhile to remember the the first reason for having a code of conduct is to protect your guests, your attendees, your visitors, and your organization. Um, and being clear. I mean, uh, codes of conduct come in a lot of different flavors um, and a lot of different structures. Some of, and I, it really depends on what your needs are, what your organization is doing. So, for example, if you are a not for profit um, organization, you're in a, putting on a, an event like this, you're going to make us get up and dance. <laughs> um, so if you are, depending on what your organization is doing, there are a lot of flavors of codes of conduct that also talk about exactly how specific they get. And I, I think a lot of what we also want to get on tonight is not only the reason that they've become important, but also making sure I think that they're effective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and how to, enforcement is a big part of code of conduct, in fact. I mean, code of conduct is really have no value other than to say we did it and have a, a very, very tenuous uh, legal protection if you don't actually have the structure in place to say who do you go to when somebody violated, who do you go to when the people who are supposed to enforce it have violated, and so on. And that's something I've had to incorporate with my organization as well. If I'm the executive director, usually people come to me, who do they go to when it's me or somebody I'm working closely with? We have that, those processes in place also. So I, I do you want to just, let me ask the question, what are you guys looking for to get out of this conversation with Codes of Conduct? Perfect. We'll get started. Uh, so um, the first one I usually have to do is the Board of Director Code of Conduct. Mm -hmm. And that one is a very interesting document because, A, it is spelling out what is, for me, that has to be the most specific. Um, it really needs to say this is what fraud is within this organization. This is the level of business you're allowed to do because all of the, in almost every organization I've been involved with, the board members are involved in other business activities with each other outside of the organization and with a lot of the different groups with whom we do business. So at what point is a board member not supposed to vote on something that's coming before us that involves their own businesses or business they've invested in or something that they're peripherally involved with or something they hope to profit in? And if there's any fiduciary responsibility. Right. Uh, let's go ahead and deal with that, because that is one of the key parts of board roles, period, whether there's a code of conduct in place. The board members have a fiduciary responsibility to the organization, which means they can't just be profiting from it blindly. They're, they have to put the finances and survival of that organization ahead of their own uh, monetary achievements. But that still really does need to be spelled out. I'm on the, uh, the board for the DeKalb Economic Development Authority. So we have very specific things talking about what level of involvement can you have with an organization before you can vote with it. And we interpret it very broadly. So if we have a company come before us and I'm anyway involved with a subsidiary or some interlocked organization with it, I'll recuse from that vote, and not just the vote, but from the discussion. Uh, so we, we go as broad as possible. If there's any chance that I could be seen 
as having a conflict of interest, I recuse regardless of what the law says. On the other hand, with my personal businesses, we have people on the boards because of those connections. And we don't want them recused, certainly not from the discussion, and even really from the vote. We want them active all the way through. And I think one of the things that becomes important about that, too, is, again, what is the purpose of your organization and what are you trying to accomplish? Because if I'm doing something that's for profit, for my businesses, for my operations, you still want to outline what those relationships can and can't look like, and especially with the financial health of the organization, the way those business interactions can and can't happen. With my board of directors, I don't do what we think of as like a dragon con code of conduct. We're not saying who you can and can't sleep with and that sort of thing. That's not in a board of directors code of conduct. We expect them to be... Want to bed? Acting for this and yours? It's not mine. <laughs> um, I've seen, in fact, I've seen that coming into way more executive levels. So in other words, for a board director and a board member, frequently now we are seeing it going in. What kind of personal relationships can you have, not only amongst the board of directors, but with uh, members of the organization? That's interesting. I, I don't have, I've been on like the uh, Atlanta Regional Commission boards and others, and that has not been spelled out as just assume that you're not going to be an idiot. But uh, you kill, still can't uh, vote on things that people with whom you're involved in are involved with. So yeah. yeah, that is spelled out, but you can get involved with them all you like. So I think next beyond that, is there anything, what else are you looking at from your board of directors? Because the things that I usually look at are the business relationships, the fiduciary responsibility, um, disclosing what legal responsibilities they do and don't have and being very specific about what their roles and responsibilities are and how they apply to the code of conduct, especially if they are uh, part of the review board for uh, any potential breach of the code of conduct. On mine, we have things about fraud specifically. This is unfortunately government become a bigger issue is even the misuse of credit cards. We've seen issues with Fulton County and they've been uh, taking uh, money they perhaps shouldn't have, but perhaps were allowed to do. So we're seeing more spelled out what's allowed for per diems, what's allowed for expenses, et cetera, beyond the, the classic you can charge for legitimate expenses. Now we're seeing it much more specifically spelled out. So, yeah, fraud has been one that I've been seeing popping up more and more. Yes, and you'll need to come up to the microphone here so we can capture your uh, mellifluous word, mellifluous tone for all posterity. Sure. So, how do you feel about the Me Too movement? How did the Me Too movement in 2017 change the way codes of conduct are written? I'll, I'll be glad to jump on part. So for boards, I haven't seen it change board of director ones. Then we get into employee conduct and volunteer conduct and attendee conduct. And that's where it's changed. Not only in the wording of the codes of conduct, but specifically in the enforcement mechanisms. This is what I referred to before. If someone's got an issue with me, who do they go to? And with a lot of organizations, yeah, if you had a problem with that person, you still had to go to that person. And now uh, you will have it set up so the executive directors or whoever's in charge of enforcement will not know about it. And there's someone on the board or a group of people on the board set up to go to. That existed before, but now I see it everywhere that, these, that the enforcement side of it is much more carefully crafted. Um, I will say this. I've seen both very good and some, some really bad things come out post Me Too. Um, we, I think we've seen organizations become a lot more definitive about what is and is not acceptable behavior um, because it used to be much more along the lines of just don't, you know, it was just either sort of fairly open and you dealt with it on a case-by-case -case basis, but it was fairly well brushed. Because there's actually now a lot more legal and, and potentially financial obligations that can go with certain uh, certain kinds of behaviors. So in other words, if somebody does something that they consider inappropriate, there's a lot greater legal and potential financial obligation that can go with that depending on how the organization deals with it. And so one of the things I have seen a lot more organizations do is have an independent board that reviews any kinds of complaints 
for organizations that are somewhat at least larger that have a decent number of people. But if you are at, a, a, let's say, a very small convention, there was one I was at a few months ago that had, really it was an incidental complaint, but it was still a complaint about somebody's behavior. Um, well, the only people that it could go to were the directors of the event. And it was, you know, thankfully it was not about them, but they had to then go and deal with, with the interaction and deal with the complaint. But I think what we've seen post Me Too is much more about spelling it out, what is and is not acceptable behavior, and much more formal processes to do it and deal with it in most at least mid-sized organizations and larger. Um, but I think that also you have to be cognizant of what kind of organization or event you're running that code of content or code of conduct to go with is how explicit. Um, so for example, one of the things that, um, so we actually, we actually did a panel here on Me Too movement a number of years ago. Um, and part of what came out of that right in the midst of it was people being much more willing to look at ideas of consent and communication. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I think that's what we've actually seen making its way into these organizations is defining and making sure that consent exists and that there is a communication channel, which I don't think was as prevalent. And affirmative consent. And I've affirmative, actually, yes. I've, I, that's something I need to put more formally into my own. But the idea that consent isn't just taken for granted, but there has to be an affirmative uh, rendering of consent for things happening. This isn't just sex. This is across the board now. If something's happening, the people involved have to have all bought in. It can't be a, you can opt out. No, it's, it's, they have to have opted in before anything can move forward. Another part, another one of the benefits of the Me Too movement I, that I've seen in codes of conduct, and you, you, t you talked about this with the procedures now being placed, is the willingness of organizations to now follow those procedures, and not just a willingness, right. but a feeling now that people have to be listened to. I think a lot of victims felt they weren't being listened to, so that was a great addition. Some folks who were uh, accused were feeling they were, weren't being listened to. So having those procedures in place create the forum, I shouldn't say the forum, but create the channels for these to actually be addressed. And one of the things about Me Too was not just that horrors were happening, but that people were complaining about it and nothing was happening. People were complaining about it and nothing was happening. People were complaining and nothing was happening about it. And Me Too said it's time for something to happen about it. And we're seeing that implementation uh, kick in and the need to take these with the gravity that they require. And, and the one thing I'm going to say, though, that we've seen that is probably on the downside is sometimes there is such an immediate reaction to a complaint that is an overreaction before there can be any kind of investigation. So when you see something happen, all of a sudden it's going, if you do something very publicly, and I've seen this happen at at least three events this year where the way things were handled was done in such a way um, that in the cases where there was no real finding after it, um, it had real negative impact of the person against whom the objection was raised, even though they were relatively minor. One of them actually involved stopping and somebody said, hey, can we have a picture? And the person went and raised and put their arm around the other person for the picture they asked for, and then they were like, but you didn't get my consent to touch me. That became a complaint that caused for that guest to be removed while they were investigating the complaint. I'll so, admit I don't find it that minor. It's, and, and well, uh, and again, this is a how you, it, it depends on the event you're at and the levels of expectation. Uh, yeah, I mean, asking for a picture and then putting the arm around, I, I see that. Mm -hmm. Those are very two different levels of yep. permission. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I certainly understand what you're saying. And one of the concerns I've had before is when groups didn't deal with these in their codes of mm -hmm. conduct, then the rumor mill would start. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was always far worse for accused and accuser than having the, the setup. Now, one thing you do raise, which I think is absolutely important 
is what do you do when you say we don't have a reason to continue on this? Mm-hmm. And then it does, there's a great risk at that point of going, well, they didn't listen to me, they didn't believe me, and then you have a greater risk of it going more public. But having that code of conduct in place and the, the fact that the processes were followed is a strong advantage for the organization, even though reputations are now going to have to take a hit when it gets louder. And uh, really the way an organization handles something like this impacts how much people want to talk about it later if they feel they were listened to. I've only had to deal with a couple of these. I'm very fortunate that nothing was serious um, and everybody, I can't say people were satisfied with the judgments, but there were no significant complaints about the the decisions afterwards. And I think having that process in place is a big part of why that's the case. Here's what's going to happen. It's spelled out. Now we can move forward. And I think one of the things that we've seen that was important, I mean, if you look at the signs around Dragon Con that are very explicit about behavior and what is and is not consent, I think is definitively a result of Me Too. I mean, a lot of that has always been here for Dragon Con, but is I think it is spelled out. And one of the things that goes back to me is spelling out what is acceptable and having that positive consent at every step. To your issue about putting a hand around another person, does it seem at all reasonable that you would add your code of conduct at this event? We think it's okay to put your hand around somebody else with consent. It seems to me there's a problem with the, the whole framework, right? It, it, and again, this was, and the reason I say it was kind of found was because the person that raised the complaint didn't really complain. They said, oh, I didn't expect it. They just jumped and it got raised, they surprised me. Well, but by saying they surprised me, this was enough to then trigger the complaint and a process where the person was like, I, I didn't mean for it to go that path. Um, and it escalated much more quickly, but they said because that was treated as a complaint, they had a zero tolerance policy, which kicked in during the period of the investigation, which of course didn't start till after the event. So, so it's interesting because I think a number of people here in this room are aware of events where there's a lot more physical contact yeah. involved than at Dragon Con. And what has become the norm for these, the codes of conduct for these events is you don't touch other people's toys, you don't touch other people's people, and you don't touch other people without right. their permission. And that is spelled out. Um, so uh, depending on the type of event you're at, that is explicit. Mm-hmm. And when you violate it, you have violated a core mm-hmm. uh, part of the code of conduct that you've agreed to. Mm-hmm. Um, Dragon Con doesn't have a specific keep your hands to yourself policy. They've got a don't be an idiot policy. So, uh, uh, it, and it often applies since the same security folks enforce a lot of these regs at different events. They tend to have a very uh they require that opt-in for the sort of behavior to happen. So, um, and uh, I talked about security before. I, I'm very happy with uh, some of the security folks around the convention circuit. They have all these different codes of conduct that they're supposed to be enforcing and somehow generally do a very good job of it. They know the codes of conduct and the attendees should as well. I like how Dragon Con puts it everywhere. I had, I very quickly, when I was researching this uh, panel, I already knew about the uh, Dragon Con Attendee Code of Conduct, uh, but I couldn't find the volunteer one. I knew it existed. And as soon as I reached out to Scott, bam, here it is. Mm-hmm. So uh, they, they've made them very public. They're in the books. I do the same at my conventions. Uh, and, and to be honest, it's a little bit of a follow-up to what uh, Dragon Con does. The Code of Conduct is very prominent uh, in the program book. It's very prominent on the website. Uh, and when the years we have an app, it's in the app too. So... Uh, communicating the code of conduct is as important as having it. Actually, it's, if you have one and don't communicate it, I think you, that you're just putting, trying to put a Band-Aid on a, on a bleeding wound. And, and frequently there are events I do where as a guest and a speaker, we actually sign off on the code of conduct as a part of right. being that guest. Um, so because, I mean, it's very clear. Here's what our expectations are. Um, and it, depending on what the event is as to what that level is, um, and, and what we do. But I'm, I'm very supportive of being clear as to what is and isn't and having a process to deal with stuff. 
Now, in, uh, I talked about board of director codes of conduct, and that's not where I'm seeing much right. of the fallout from Me Too. Employee codes of conduct, absolutely. Uh, volunteer codes of conduct, somewhat. At least they now spell out that enforcement side. And attendee code of conduct, absolutely. Definitely seeing that spelled out. And organizations taking more seriously and having real uh, enforcement uh, mechanisms in place. And other things, that, you know, beyond, did we answer everybody's question in terms of, I think, Me Too and physical contact? And Because, again, I want to reiterate, I do firmly believe in getting consent as you go step by step, depending on what's going on, um, and making sure. I mean, I, I think that's just where we are and as a society is making sure that we everybody has assented. And I think that's part of what we see, to see is the social contract that we're trying to reinforce with the code's conduct. But I think an area we didn't touch in is the social media side of mm-hmm. it as well, because Me Too is a hashtag. It is right. the definitive, a definitive social media movement. And it's also interesting seeing how organizations are including social media in their code of conduct. Mm-hmm. So if you're happy with how we handled that before, I think this would be a great segue right. to talk about social media for, uh, uh, for codes of conduct. Sure. Um, so uh, for some of the work that I do, it is very explicit. I share nothing on social media. There is zero about any of the agreements. I mean, I, I have a lot of the work I do is very structured around there's nothing about social media. And my social media presence, and I run an online convention. I do a lot of social media. I do a lot of podcasts. I do a lot of interviews. But... <clears throat> There's a lot of the work that I do that is not going to be shared out, never going to be shared out, never going to be talked about. Um, Or if I do mention it, it is so very generically referenced for an example on something that, but a lot of the organizations, especially if you're talking about um, corporate entities, have the ability for their employees to regulate what they can and cannot post on social media. And I will tell you, very frequently, I have, ha- I, have, uh, I have had to do stuff in organizations where we have um, reprimanded, terminated people for things that seemed fairly innocuous on their social media, but because it was a violation um, of it, and again, innocuous is in the eye of the beholder, but having that code of conduct that says what is and is, is, and is not acceptable um, and social media because it has become so prevalent and one of the things I don't think a lot of people understand is one of the things that you've signed on to when you are hired is that you have opened up a lot of your life as a book and you are probably much more monitored than you realize. So I first got bit by this in 95. So if you want to think social media issues are new, they, they really aren't that new. So in 95, I have a company, Holistic Design, or game development company, Buyer, Noble Armada, and for the Fading Suns games, please. Uh, we just hired a new programmer out of the Baltimore area, and he hadn't even come to Atlanta yet to work for us. We went up to visit a publisher of ours up in the Baltimore area, Microprose, great strategy game publisher, you all remember them. And the first thing that we're coming in here, we've got a great game going with them. We're going to hash out some things. It's going to be a great meeting. They stick a piece of paper in front of us, and it's him on some BBS back in 95 complaining about Microprose and saying he doesn't like what they do and so forth and so on. It's like, what are you going to do about this? It's like, what the hell? Uh, and it was some obscure BBS, and they had uh, they had seen it. So, um, yeah, never even considered a social media policy before that and suddenly it becomes a very important thing for us uh, to implement. And again, at the different levels of an organization, they have different roles. Board of directors, uh, it's very hard to limit what we say, but it's also hard for anyone to think we're not speaking as a representative of the organization because we are the key representative of the organization. If I say something for any of these organizations that I'm on the board of, it is normal to think of that as a position of policy for that organization. And when I speak at city council meetings, I make a point of saying I'm not speaking on behalf of any organization with which I'm involved if I'm not, and being clear if I am. But you can't really shut up a board of directors. Uh, and it, I, I see generally those social media policies are the don't be an idiot ones. Then you get to the employee agreements, and that's very specifically 
here's what you can and can't say. Uh, in the game industry, a lot of them are very clear that you cannot speak as an employee. If you're very clear, you're not speaking as an employee of the organization if you're not using an official channel. And the social media people and the community managers have their very specific channels that they can use. And whenever they are on that, they are speaking as a representative of the organization. Anything they say on that is as if the company itself was saying it. And But on their own personal ones, they cannot speak about the organizational things in order to keep those from, from muddying uh, over. Volunteers, you can't shut them up. You can request it, but you're not paying them. You can't take away their salaries if they come out. But also, people aren't going to think that they're actually speaking for the organization in most cases. So volunteer ones, I very rarely see, uh, please don't talk about the organization. Please only retweet what we tweet, etc. And of course, for attendees, you ain't ever going to be able to muzzle them. They're going to say everything. Well, actually, that's not true. Uh-oh. Um, there are events, tech events that I have done. That's true. Where, there are tech events that have an NDA that goes along with them. Yeah. Um, because you're like, well, don't you want to promote on social media? No, we don't want anyone <laughs> to know that these events exist. We don't want anyone. Now to we're going to have to kill all of you. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> but thanks for joining. Um, but I, one of the other things I want to say is, you know, one of the things that can impact you much like you're alluding to is your social media activity follows you forever and can affect you forever. We've seen that happen with James Gunn with a tweet from, you know, years earlier. Not long ago, there was a young lady who had gotten her dream job to be an editor for one of the teen magazines. This was very public. Um, she had her offer rescinded because of a tweet she had posted. I think it was a tweet. It was either Twitter or Instagram. Something she had posted as a 16-year-old was then held against her. I mean, so again, social media is going to follow you. So your organization, your social media policy is there to protect you as the organization, but also to protect your people to make sure that somebody can't post or tweet something that is defamatory towards your organization or your other people, whether it's a volunteer, whether it's an attendee, or whether it's a board member. Um, there's a guy that I, I think you might have heard of who, who occasionally gets a little involved with Twitter um, who seems to be on a board of a couple of small companies um, that you would think somebody would be trying He's to He's elongated? Up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, And the FTC was very happy with everything he oh tweeted. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so, I mean, from that standpoint, again, to your point, if you own the company, you can say and do whatever you want to do. You just don't have a right to complain if there's an implication that you don't like. Yeah. One thing that's been interesting and I've seen as well in, in game industry codes of conduct are also about retweeting mm -hmm. and reposting from other places and asking you specifically, have, putting specific limits on that, uh, on the types of organizations from whom you can tweet, can't, can't retweet, can't repost, etc., uh, and, and in those cases, they're not saying who you can't. They're saying who you can. They're really limiting who they want. And reputable game industry, media sites, et cetera, they want you tweeting from one, some weird site nobody's heard of that turns out to be some of the most absolute idiots in the world all of a sudden. So it, it's interesting looking at these long policies of here's what you can and can't retweet as opposed to here's what can and can't be done as original content, that what you're doing from others is a lot more limited. And I think one of the things you see in terms of code of conduct as well is other activities, both business and non-business activities. There are a lot of, uh, we're seeing a lot more of this occurring in organizations where they go and say, if you're going to come join our organization, you are prohibited from engaging in certain types of activities. Um, and there have been some lawsuits around whether or not this was legal or not because of people being dismissed from organizations. A um, couple of, of latest cases were people that were, um, you know, on church boards. People were getting dismissed because of some of the other facets of life. Um, people who were being dismissed from a lot of different organizations because of belief systems were enough to be dismissed because these things went to the organizational code of conduct. So being aware of the code of conduct can also tell you a lot about the organization 
that you're being a member of and whether or not you wish to do that, whether it's a corporate entity that you're looking to work for, um, it is a profit, a non-for-profit event, anything along those lines. I think awareness of what the expectations are set in a code of conduct will tell you a lot about how the organization looks at you participating in that level. And another thing you'll see that will be a good judge of this is the specificity of those codes of conduct. So generally, the codes of conduct I'm experienced with, the employee ones, are the most exact. They spell out in the greatest detail what isn't, isn't, isn't allowed, because this is where the lawsuits are most likely to happen. Uh, so they do read like legalese because they are legalese. The board directors ones have a, I guess a, a way to phrase it is that they're more um, understandable. The legalese isn't as omnipresent because they really are looking for board members. They know that part of the way why they're taking these board members is because they have relationships with so many other people and organizations. And um, it's not the page after page of an employee agreement. And then you look at the volunteer and attendees, and those are the least specific with the broadest range. A, that gives the organization the greatest range to deal with some situation they never would have expected to come up. Again, the Dragon Con don't be an asshole policy. Well, it's not officially don't be an asshole, but the don't be an idiot policies give a lot of leeway uh, for, for acting. And since the greatest harm is you're taking away a badge, there's not much legal repercussion that's uh, going to come from it if someone uh, complains later on. I was pu trying to pull up one of my old codes of conduct, but my website is not being happy and wanting me to uh, to do it quickly, which is really annoying. Um, but uh, the idea is you want, I actually want people to read it. So it's conversational, it's a little funny, uh, and it's not horribly long because I actually want folks to know that it exists and to have read it. I, I fear that a lot of companies hope that employees don't read their whole codes of conduct, but I think they're really foolish in that case because employees really should live by it. But man, I've seen some that I have, I would take immediately to the lawyer and say, what the hell does this mean? And, and the, I, 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 ah, microphone, you you're the one the person who should know this. Oh, you can do the rock star walk and everything. We're all the way from the back. Do we need to roll off the red carpet? <laughs> no, there. My company's, Every six months, employee mandatory training. We have to we have mm -hmm. to go through and answer questions from the code of conduct to, to, to they understand that we've renewed it every six months. It hasn't changed, but thanks. <laughs> uh, are the questions different every time, or are they so they're actually paying money for a new everything? So smaller companies unfortunately can't afford this. Can't even afford the time for you to do it, much less four well four hundred thousand employees yeah. and. It's a pool of rotating questions, so it's not the same questions all the time. And I do add some more, and they, you know, randomly haven't seen them. But and that's a great level of protection on the legal front. The fact you've quizzed them with like that 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 is giving the company a great deal more protection. Small companies can't do that. Small companies also probably don't have the twenty-page code of conducts that you get at other places. But uh, I've never seen the Goldman Sachs code of conduct. I'd be interested in seeing it, but I understand those uh, and for other financial yeah. institutions are especially detailed and involved and you probably need to have read if you're going to work for that company so yes less onerous for the writers ones the writers who can actually write these things don't have the long ones do they oh no i'm i, I do a lot of work in the financial industry i am used to very detailed ones um, i think one of the other things that becomes really interesting about your code of conduct is making sure as that it's enforceable and understanding the legality of what is and is not enforceable out of the code of conduct. Um, and again, I think this goes along with depending on what your organization is and does, um, but we've seen a lot more cases coming out where they're saying that elements of codes of conduct are not enforceable. Um, and I think that's one of those things that, that also gets interesting is making sure that everything you're putting in there is actually legal. So you're talking about in regards to speech or to... Uh, I have seen elements of it regard in regards to speech. I have seen elements in regards to... I'll give you a perfect example. There is a particular religious um, school to which um, they have their all of their teachers sign a code of conduct about certain behaviors. 
and we've seen a lot of right. you know you know oh well you may have been getting married in two weeks but you moved in with them two weeks before the wedding you're gone right, right. we've seen i mean that was a lawsuit i think about a year and a half ago um and there's a question of is it le how much behavior can you control outside of the organization's interests um other things that i've seen have actually regarded um, people's again business or fiduciary activity outside of the environment and generally this is an employer agreement going and saying well you you know it could go to you have to disclose um, all the way down to they have to approve um, I have been in environments where I had to have books approved before they could go out the door I've had it had to be approved before where an article had to be approved before I could have it published I've had it where um, even me speaking at certain events had to be approved before right. I did it. Um, and again, this is knowledge of the code of conduct and what you can and can't do. Scott gets to deal with this every year. He's got people saying, you want me to join a panel late? Wait, I've got to get it approved through 60 different people within the organization first. So I do feel for Scott on that, uh, on that uh, problem. Another area where I have seen considerations, again, talking about the behavior side, he was talking about churches. I've never written up a code of conduct for a religious organizations, so I can't speak too well to it, but obviously LGBTQ issues have been an issue with some of those. Um, and I have heard of companies getting in trouble, and this is where I don't have specific expertise. You think that the banning people within a company from dating each other would be a pretty standard one. I see it in a lot of them, but I have also heard of companies who did get in trouble for trying to enforce those specific uh, parts of their codes of conduct. So... I'm not sure. This is where we would need a lawyer on it to, to talk about it. I think most companies have that in, but I don't know how far push can come to shove when they fire people for dating within the company. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, and again, often it's a matter of you, you know, you can't be in the same management chain or you have to at least disclose it. Um, if you're above a certain level of management, you have to both actually register it with the company right. that you're engaged in personal activity it doesn't even have to be dating but any sort of outside personal relationship can just literally be friendship has to be registered with the company because there is a potential risk that you may discuss business activity outside or your relationship could break down and become problematic which then results in damage to the company so again be aware of the things that you're signing because it can have def definite implications on your external life outside of the organization. And the question of disclosure is a really interesting one as well on those different levels of um, codes of conduct. On most of the board code of conducts I have, if I have a conflict, I'm not required to disclose what that conflict is. I just say I'm recusing because I've got a conflict. We always do. There's no reason not to. It's, it's generally common knowledge. But I'm not required to say why I'm recusing. On the other hand, within on your appointment agreements, if you have to disclose something, you got to disclose the whole thing. I mean, you don't have to discuss how many dollars you had or how many dates you've been on or whatever, but you have to give specifics that I, as a board member, do not have to surrender. So uh, interesting levels of um, enforcement as you go on through the organization. Uh, another issue I think we might want to address is the ability to negotiate codes of conduct. And I have seen this. Uh, people saying, well, I'm coming in with this already in place. One of the most common, this is what I actually have done, uh, is outside work. When I've gone to work with somebody else and they have something that says uh, you can't do outside work. Well, I've already got my own company going. I'm not going to stop that. Right. So we get an exception written in for that. So when you're going in as an employee, don't be afraid to negotiate your code of conduct. Make sure that it actually does fit your lifestyle because uh, there's no law requiring them to have you find this code of conduct if they want you make sure it works for you as well other things I've seen um, becoming a little bit more common in codes of conduct um, you know beyond it, the, the personal relationships the fiduciary relationships um, also become and again this goes back to some of the things that I do is also about what kind of data and what kind of countries you can interact with um, so, for example, um, I went to Cuba a number of years ago, and I had to get a ton of sign-offs for that. Um, 
but if you are going and even emailing back and forth in certain certain governments, certain countries, certain things, you've got to get a lot of permission depending again on what you're doing. Yeah. And we're seeing this more in government now where they are limiting, for instance, what you can put in your LinkedIn because obviously mm-hmm. you put what government agency you work for, but you and that government agency suddenly you've revealed uh, classified information just by talking in any About sense the organization. about what you do. So, yeah, it is funny seeing that there are limits on what you can put on LinkedIn, which we normally think is throw up everything in there, it'll get you a new job. So uh, it is funny seeing those come into place exactly for those international reasons. So what kind of questions do you guys have that we haven't necessarily dove, dove into? Are there any <laughs> All of them. Um I uh, going back again, and the one thing I do want to make clear out here is that it really depends on the organization and the purpose of the organization as to what they are and are not doing, um, as to what's going on. But in terms of actual civil civil liberties, yes, I mean LGBTQ issues are huge in certain spaces in certain areas. And if you see people going and saying, yes, you cannot, you can or can't do certain things, that often is going to be an indicator of what kind of organization you're talking about. But beyond that, free speech. Um, the idea of free speech, I don't think most people recognize. If you sign on to work, work for anything midsize or a larger company, you have surrendered at least some portion of your rights to free speech. Um, and it, this is one of those things I don't think most people are aware of. And this applies not only to social media, um, but this applies uh, across a lot of different spaces and a lot of different areas to restrict your ability to communicate certain ideas. And this is even more so on governmental codes of conduct. Mm-hmm. So most government employees, especially in Georgia, are not supposed to advocate for politicians. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it is uh, of that goes across the causes. So uh, it's a fascinating restriction on what we would normally consider a very basic uh, freedom of liberty, and sometimes this is applied to teachers. So it's been fascinating seeing um, different groups try and enforce what government employees can and cannot say, can and cannot do on a far more restrictive level than most companies would do. I mean... uh, because if you're working for the government, you're supposed to be working in the public interest. That's right. So most companies will say if you're working on a political campaign, you have to be clear that you're not representing the company. But they're not going to restrict your ability. In fact, I'm not even sure of the legality of them restricting your ability to be on a political campaign. On the other hand, government can restrict that. So, uh, and uh, there's some fascinating other levels where governmental codes of conduct can just be, we talk about civil liberties, far more in conflict. So uh, I'm going to speak very generically. I am not an attorney, nor am I pretending to be one currently on a panel. Um, But a lot of the time, NDAs are not enforceable. And especially once they get into very specific, the more specific they are, often the less enforceable they are because they ask for things that are not reasonable. At the same time, if you've signed one, how willing are you to go and fight them? with the risk of what happens if you lose. Um, You know, going and looking at, I I will tell you, it's not just Donald Trump. For the most part, if you were dealing with an executive, if you were dealing with a celebrity, if you're dealing with somebody who has beyond a certain degree of money and power, you're signing NDAs all over the place. And those NDAs are largely designed to tell you what you can and can't do. Um, and what their expectations are if you're coming to do work for them. Um, and I mean, some of the ones that I've, you know, I have signed, I generally will not sign an NDA. Um, there are very specific provisions by which I will sign NDAs, but generally I will not sign an NDA depending on what the work is. Um, but there are times certain work I do, I absolutely have to, to do that particular work. Um, 
but if you look at any celebrity, if you look at any government, you know, any money person, the rules are operating a bit different because they, that's the only way that they have of maintaining a certain expectation of privacy. And uh, so I think there's a little bit of a difference there when you're working for somebody like that in their organization. Now, that being said, we also have seen NDAs that have come out from people like Donald Trump and others um, that you look at and you go, why would anybody sign this? Well, it's because of the check they're being written. Um, most of these things, I mean, I've, I've seen ones that have you know, a 30 year termination date, no termination date. Yeah. I mean, reasonableness is an important legal issue. Not a lawyer, also not a lawyer, but I mean, uh, a, an eternal NDA is, uh, is relatively questionable. There should be, yeah. there should be a term in it to make it reasonable. On the other hand, with employment agreements, it is, I never see a code of conduct where the NDA is incorporated into it. Usually you're signing Separate two agreement. different pieces of paper just for the severability issue if one of these is bad i got you on the other one and often you'll see redundancies between them so if they can't enforce one they'll try and enforce the other a lot of ndas that i do see have no punishment clause to it so i mean the punishment is whatever a judge would warrant in most cases we go away uh, on the other hand some have very specific punishments written into it and then you got to be a lot more concerned about it employment agreement generally the punishment is you're fired or reprimanded or whatever. So can be different levels of danger for you signing either one of them. But yeah, I mean, it is fascinating. You would think that the NDA would be spelled in code of conduct, but it's not. It is usually something else that you're assigned, a very specific document, uh, not a code of conduct. I, I agree. Uh, my companies has got like, oh, it's, it's indefinite. So even if I've left the company, it still applies, yeah, yeah. and right. it applies to my family. And I'm like, <laughs> my family isn't in agreement with you. They don't have anything to do with you, and you don't know anything about my family. But and hey, cool. And it's the the concept. Mm -hmm. You're paying a paycheck. It's pretty decent. I'll take it. I don't really care, you know. And then the second point is, yes, we're going to fire you all the time. Yeah. That's that's this can be the possible, or this can be the possible, or criminal can be the thing. But we're going to fire you. Right. You know, like, we're going to fire you and there could be other implications. Yeah. I'm like, thanks, guys. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I've, I, I've seen a wide variety of NDAs. I mean, in game industry, obviously, people love NDAs. Dealing in economic development, we're dealing with NDAs all the time. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I do have to sign far too many NDAs yeah. just to I'm, I'm deal. I am still dealing with NDAs. I consider them in existence from 30 years ago. I'm still abiding from them. I'm sure the term's gone, but I'm still abiding by them. So uh, just as a matter of principle, it's better when you've got this many NDAs you have signed. Sorry, I've signed too many of them. Yeah. Just, just keep, just keep go believing they're in force and, and, uh, and don't talk about them. Well, and honestly, for me, if I disclosed a lot of the stuff, I'd never work in certain areas again. Right. And I mean, that yeah. does bring up the question, and uh, I think this is a great one to, to bring up now, which is the uh, whole idea of compensation information. What can you share about your compensation? And... Uh, it's often not spelled out specifically. I, I can't think of anywhere where I have seen it spelled out specifically, but I have seen companies talk about it as being a part of their mm -hmm. NDA, not the code of conduct. In other words, you've signed a contract. All contracts are covered by the NDA. Therefore, you can't talk about your contract. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, reasonableness would be an issue in this regard. But uh, companies, a lot of companies have made it clear they don't want you talking about salary. They don't want you talking about compensation forms of all types. So, but uh, it's not something I've ever seen written into a code of conduct. Have you ever seen it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've seen it specifically. All right. Um, where you can't talk about comp, bonuses, stuff like that, because it's considered private. Now, one of the things it does. You can't talk about others. You can talk you about can, yours. No, you can't even can't talk, talk about, about yours. yours. All right. Okay. Um so I mean it's and again some of this is some of the space I work in uh, one of the other, and I mean again I've signed a lot more NDAs than I, I would like but a lot of the time if somebody comes and says I need you to sign an NDA for certain things I'm like no yep. I mean my other agreements and things like that will cover it because it's in there I'm you know this is confidential for your work I mean a lot of what I deal with is intellectual property 
So, yeah, there's a reasonableness to going saying, no, you can't disclose these things, but there's other clauses in there. Um, some of the other consulting we do with people, uh, with my wife and her company, um, you know, a lot of the clients that she works with, she's dealing not only with their businesses, but with them as people and their personal life and has knowledge, things that could potentially be damaging if it got out. So when she's dealing with those people, she has a very strong NDA written into her contracts because she's dealing with the people and the businesses themselves because she's often dealing with business owners. Um, so the NDAs there are pretty strong, but again, there's also that degree of if you go and disclose things, um, you're also out of business because there's a large degree here where there has to be trust. Um, and I, one of the reasons I am a fan of having codes of conduct in these things like this is to spell it out explicitly. What are the things that the company believes are in its best interests? And if you wish to work with that organization, you need to be in alignment with those. And if you're not in alignment with those, you probably don't need to work for the organization. Yep, I'm actually pulling up the uh, code of conduct, the policies, they call them policies in here. And uh, I think it's a great thing for them to have in here and for people to actually read it. Um, and and we I, think want people, I think that the codes of conduct actually do help people when they're well-crafted to act appropriately and intelligently at work and not be idiots. Uh, so I do think there's a very good role for them. I also think they can be poorly used and abused. All right. I think we're down to like five minutes or so. If anybody, any more questions? You've had one, so come on. Come on down. The question is right. I have like six. Cool. But um, the main one is um, for my own company and um, that I'm hoping to form into a nonprofit organization. And, and I want to do something. I have Discord. And I want to do something like a code of conduct where people come in. This is the way we expect you to be, to be. And then also I work for a company that I run their Discord. So I, I need to have two separate ones because one's a paid. Or should I just kind of focus on one kind of general? Or should I be more specific with the ones where um, the company that I work for, it's a paid subscription. And it's a Discord where only paid subscribers are allowed to be in, and I got to make sure that everybody plays well together, and no one gets offended, which is hard. But um, should I write just one and no multiple? Go? You definitely yeah. need multiple. Okay. You need that one that's just right there, pinned to the mm -hmm. rules and conduct on the Discord channel. You need one for your employees. You need one for your mods if they're volunteers. Okay. Um, and, and they're going to be different. Okay. Uh, I mean, the don't be an idiot will be core to all of those, but there's going to be a lot of differences between them. You can't okay. limit the mods yeah. like you can your employees. And right. people on there, you you want to encourage a little bit of uh, of uh, back and forth argumentation between them. You just want them to be asses about it. Right. And that's kind of where it's like, where do I draw that line? And... You know, I'm like, okay, who do I make them, like, form a complaint to? Because what if it's about me, the person that's running it? You know, and I, I didn't go that deep, but I wanted to say thank you for, so for, for, for my, making my brain explode a little bit. <laughs> for, for my attendees and volunteers, the main rule is you're in a professional association. You are supposed to act professionally. If your conduct would not be considered professional, it's something that you banned. So that is a vague standard, but it's one that everyone's got a decent idea of what it means. That won't work for an employee. Right. Right. But that will work for attendees and volunteers. Right. And we have varying levels of employees that are in the Discord, all the way from our creator support to our coaches and, like, higher management. So do I write I, one for all of them or do I have to differentiate between the levels of employment? I, I would start with a generic one. Okay. Build out the one for the folks who are just going to be speaking in there and then get more specific because there's definitely things you don't want coaches saying that you don't care if yeah. just your paid folks are saying. Mm 
Right, okay. And there's okay. one other thing I want to add because we've been probably operating from the thou shalt not. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. But also you, you want to be very careful about the language you use. This is the writer coming out. You want the language to encourage people to take the behavior you wish to right. see. Right. Not about you shall not or we will smite you. There has to be some of that in there. Well, and even in the, the rules that I have now, because I did do a general, like, hey, be nice to each other. You know, like, okay, this is Discord's house, so we got to play by their rules. Right. And I wrote it just pretty much just like that. And I wrote it very freeform and very understanding because I, I don't want to go pay for a membership and then have someone come down on me with a bunch of rules. I want, you know, I want it to be fun. And that's the kind of environment I want it to be. What's the but number one rule of Dragon be... Con? Have fun. Mm -hmm. The number one rule, am I correct? Used to be the number one rule. I thought it was don't fall down the stairs. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you had five more questions. <laughs> I have a lot more questions, but I, um, that was my main one. And okay. I'll, and I'll, yeah, d different ones. The, they're just, Definitely. So I'm going to go in and do that next and get week. your boilerplate low level one with the least restrictive and then build it out from there okay the the big thing again i would look at is who does it apply to and what do they need to know okay yep that's a good breakdown i can remember that <laughs> <laughs> thank you sure and remember to rate this uh rate this panel, panel. In, your, in your forum no in your in your app rate this panel in your app all right thank you thank you guys